So last week we started our Bible story with my favorite Bible character, Zaphonath Paneah. You guys remember Zaphonath Paneah? Yeah. What's his real name? Joseph. All right, his name is Zaphonath Paneah, but that's the name he's given later. You're going to find out about that in a couple of weeks. Who gave him the name Zaphonath Paneah? Why he was given that name? What that name means? But his name really is Joseph. That's the name that his mom and dad gave him. All right. And uh, last week you learned a lot about him. But he ended with a little bit of a cliffhanger, right? Yeah. So, are you guys ready to uh, meet him again? Yeah. Now remember, we're using our imaginations. I'm telling the story as though I'm him. So don't say, it's really Pastor Carl. But, yeah, obviously it is. We're having fun. I'm pretending, all right? So, you guys want to see him again? Yeah. All right. Let me go get his little coat. And let's hear today's story is really embarrassing so be nice to joseph all right as soon as it's quiet joseph will be here hey it's great to be back and yeah i know my coat got ripped and covered with blood in my last story but i'm just wearing this to help you imagine if you weren't here last week, my name is Joseph, and I was the youngest of 12 brothers. And because I was the youngest, I was kind of my mom and dad's favorite. You remember that? And God gave me these amazing dreams. You guys remember really quick? One of them was where, you know, my, you know, stalk of wheat um, got really big, and my, my brother's stalks all bowed down to me. They didn't like that dream, did they? And then I had this other dream where my star got really big and, and 11 other stars bowed down to my star. And even the sun and the moon bowed down and they didn't like that dream either. They said, what, even mom and dad are going to bow down to you? Well, then it happened where my dad sent me out to check on them and uh, they saw me coming and I was a little bit of a tattletale. And it's not really cool to tattle, but they, they didn't just get mad at me, they decided to kill me. That's a little overreaction, you know, to tattling. But instead of killing me, to their credit, they threw me in a pit, and they were deciding what to do with me when they sold me as a slave. Now, I got carried off to Egypt, and they put me up for sale, but because I was young and strong, and did I mention I was very handsome? Yeah, I think I did. I got sold for a pretty good amount of money. And I got sold to a really rich guy, actually a really powerful guy. My new owner, I, I'd rather call him my boss, but he was my owner. He was actually the captain of the Pharaoh's guards. Do you know what the Pharaoh is? In, in my country, he's like the president. He, he doesn't get voted though. Like he's like the head honcho, the top tomato, the big cheese of the whole country of Egypt. And my owner, boss, he, he's like in charge of his personal guards. So I got to live in a beautiful palace with great food. And if you remember last week, I told you, you know, I wasn't happy about being a slave. It didn't really fit with those visions, those dreams God gave me. But I decided, you know what, if I'm going to be a slave, then I'm going to be the best slave there ever was. And so I worked my hardest. And whatever they gave me to do, I just decided I'm just going to do it for God instead of for my boss. And you know what? My boss noticed. And he ended up putting me in charge. And one day, he took off his fancy ring. And he gave me the ring. And he said, Joseph, you're still a slave. But you know what? I'm going to put you in charge of my entire house. You are now like the boss of my whole house. I'm going to put you in charge of everything. All the servants. All the workers. Only me and, of course, my wife are more important than you. Everybody works for you. Wow. I got a nice room. I got nice clothes. I got to eat the finest food. I could leave the palace anytime I wanted and go out to nice restaurants. I could travel all over Egypt because he trusted me to not run away. He trusted me to always come back. Even though I was a slave, he didn't have to chain me or tie me up because he knew that I was a religious man and that I, that I believed in God. And so because I was faithful to God, I, I got promoted. It was pretty awesome. So life was really good. I mean, my brothers weren't bowing down to me or my mom or dad. I didn't really 
need that or want that. I didn't really know what that meant. But life was really good. And so I was enjoying running the household and making sure everything went great. It was good for my boss because he had more important things to do. He was worried about the captain's guards and keeping the pharaohs safe. And things were going really good for a while. But I got I to gotta tell you about my boss's wife, Mrs. Potiphar. Now, I don't want to say anything bad about her, but Miss Potiphar, well, she was, how do I say this nicely? Well, she was a powerful lady. She was a rich lady. And no one ever said no to Miss Potiphar. I mean, Mrs. Potiphar's wife, I mean, excuse me, Miss Potiphar's husband was the captain of the Pharaoh's guards. So if Miss Potiphar wanted something, Miss Potiphar got it. I mean, if Miss Potiphar wanted a new camel, she didn't just get a camel. She got the nicest camel in all of Egypt, right? If Miss Potiphar wanted to go to a fancy restaurant, she didn't have to make reservations. She could just take her and all her little ladies that served her. She could just walk to the restaurant, and if there wasn't room, they'd kick people out of the restaurant because Mrs. Potiphar was there. You know, she didn't have to make reservations. That was for, you know, the peasants and the lowly people. If Miss Potiphar, you know, wanted a new dress, why, they would custom make her one, and it, they would spare no expense. She was, can I say, kind of spoiled. I mean, people didn't say no to Miss Potiphar. I mean, why would you say no to Miss Potiphar? I mean, her husband's in charge of the most powerful soldiers in all of Egypt. So if you said no to Miss Potiphar, she could go to her husband and go, that person said no to me, and he could send his little soldiers over there and go, you said no to my wife? <laughs> you know, get the point? Now, I don't know that he would actually do that, but you're not exactly going to take a chance with it. You know what I'm saying? So Mrs. Potiphar got whatever she wanted. And if someone always gets everything they want, they're kind of spoiled. So I got to tell you, I avoided Mrs. Potiphar. You know, if Miss Potiphar came to the house, I suddenly had something to do in the warehouse. Then Miss Potiphar came by the warehouse to boss people around. I needed to go over to, you know, somewhere else. So I just avoided her because I was in charge of everybody and everything. And I was nice to everybody. And so they all really were nice to me. But Miss Potiphar, everybody was afraid of. And honestly, I was a little afraid of her too. So my best policy was don't be wherever Miss Potiphar is, right? You just don't cross Mrs. Potiphar, the boss lady. Well, one day I was hanging out at the palace, and Miss Potiphar came, and I thought, oh, Miss Potiphar's here. I don't want to offend her, but I'm just going to politely be like, oh, you know, I got some errands to run. And she said, no, Joseph, don't leave. Well, I can't leave if the boss lady says don't leave. So I'm like, all right. So I kind of sat on the couch, and I kind of started reading the Egyptian times, you know. And but there's people around, so I'm not too worried about it. And then Mrs. Potiphar starts going around the palace, and she starts going to different servants, going, oh, you can go home. And she goes over to another servant, oh, this looks fine, you go home. And she starts sending people home, and I'm starting to get really uncomfortable. Because pretty soon, it's like me and Miss Potiphar all alone. And I'm feeling kind of, this is kind of weird, you know, I'm kind of all alone. Boss's wife. And then she goes up to the door and goes, click, click. She locks the door. And I'm trying to read my Egyptian times, and she kind of saunters over to the window. Choo -choo. She locks the window. And then she goes over to another couch, and she lays down, and she puts her hair back, so it's her dress kind of fall on the floor. And she's like, hello, Joseph. It looks like we're alone. And I'm like, um, yeah, would you like me to call somebody? No. I'm fine with being alone, if you're fine with being alone. I'm like, no, actually, I think we should have a party. I think we should call people, you know, and, and have the cooks bring some food. And she's like, no, I kind of like being alone with you, Joseph. And then she stands up and she goes, so, do you think I'm pretty? <laughs> well, that's a dangerous question for a guy because if you say, no, I don't think you're pretty, you're calling the boss's wife ugly, and you never tell a girl she's ugly, right? But I don't want to say she's pretty and be like complimenting the boss's wife. So I'm like, okay, God, what do I do? And I said, well, you look very nice today, Mrs. Potiphar. Well, she had on this fancy robe with her fancy dress, and she pulls a little string and lets her robe just fall down onto the floor. And she says, do you like my dress? 
Very nice dress, Mrs. Potiphar. And then she goes, whing, whing, and kicks off her shoes and wiggles her little toes. And she says, you look very handsome today, Joseph. Well, yeah, I don't want to argue with her. I did mention I was very handsome. And I just said, well, thank you, Mrs. Potiphar. That's very nice of you to say so. And then she reaches up to her hair and is all up, all fancy schmancy, like the girls like to do. And she pulls out some pins. And her hair goes flowing down. And she does the <laughs> like the girls like to do. She says, how do you like my hair? I said, well, it was, it was nice when it was all up and all. So then she kind of does this little slinky walk up to me and puts her hands on my shoulders. And I'm like, ah. she said, we're all in love. Would you like a little speech? I'm like, no, nah! <laughs> Miss Potiphar, no, I would not like a little smooch. You are my boss's wife. I do not want a smooch. I said no to her. You would not believe the look on her face. She looked at me like, what was that word? I've never heard that word before. Did, 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 did I just hear the word no? Did this peasant slave boy just call me no? So she kind of, <clears throat> I'm going to pretend that I did not hear that. She comes back over to me and grabs her arms around me and gives me this big old smacker right on my cheek. And, she, and I'm like, no! She goes, kiss me back right now. And I'm like, no! And I'm thinking, you know, if Mr. Potiphar walked in right now, this would not be a very good situation. And so I had to push away. And I'm like, Mrs. Potiphar, I can't do this. This is wrong. You are my boss's wife. Not only are you my boss's wife, so I can't smoochie with you, but this is wrong before my God. You know, I mean, I, I wanted to get married someday, and I hoped I would meet a nice girl someday and have a family and have kids, but, but this was my boss's wife. This was bad. And so I said, I can't do this. He says, you are a slave boy. My husband bought you on a street. You have to do whatever I say. Nobody says no to me, slave. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I, I can't do that. Are you saying no to me? Yes. <laughs> You're not going to believe what she did next. I thought she was going to attack me. But I was stronger than her. There's no way she would win in a fight. I didn't want to fight her. She's glaring at me with such anger and such rage. Yes. And then, the most incredible thing happened. <sighs> she melted. It was so nice and so sweet. And then she screamed. Ah! And went, what? Ah! And she grabs her dress and she rips one arm. Then she rips the other arm. Then she reaches down, she rips the bottom of her dress. Ah! And then she grabs me. Ah! And I can't let go. Ah! Help me, help me! She starts messing up her hair. Ah! She starts ripping some of her jewelry off and throwing her jewelry. Ah, I'm like, help me, help me. Well, when the king's guard hear a girl screaming, what do you think they do? They come running. They don't even notice the door's locked. They break down the door. They come in with their spears. And what do they see? They see a fight between me and Mrs. Potiphar. And, of course, she lets go at that point. Ah, help me, help me. Ah. And the guards surround me. They grab me and they pull me back. And she goes, oh, that's my head. He locked the doors. And he attacked me. He kissed me. And he treated me. I tried to say no. And he ripped my dress. And he tried to steal my jewelry. He sees you. Well, Mr. Potiphar was summoned. And they were holding me back. And I'm saying, it's not true. It's not true. And Mr. Potiphar comes in. And he sees his wife in tears nice dress all ripped up and crying and he sees me being held by the soldiers I'm like sir sir it's not true it's not true sir I, I would never do this thing you've been so good to me sir and he looks at his wife he goes, honey honey buddy buddy she hugs and kisses her oh honey buddy I'm so glad you're here <laughs> it was a really good night 
Potiphar looks at me and he goes, Joseph, how could you do this to me? After all I have done for you, I elevated you. I trusted you. I let you come and go as you please. I gave you, give me that. He grabs my hand. He rips the ring off. I gave you my signet ring. I gave you clothes. I gave you food. I trusted you with everything. I told you everything I had was yours. The only thing I withheld from you was with myself and my wife. The one thing I said you couldn't have, you tried to take from me. You hurt me, Joseph. And I could tell it really hurt him. He really liked me. And so I think that's why he didn't kill me. And he said, guards, take him away. I never want to see him again. Take him to the deepest, darkest dungeon you can find in all of Egypt. And may he rot there for the rest of his life. And so that's what happened. They stripped me of my nice clothes, put me in chains, and took me down into the dungeon. And I sat there and they're going, what just happened? Here I tried to do what was right. I tried to trust God. I tried to be a good slave, even though I hadn't done anything wrong. I tried to trust God. And this lady totally lies. And I mean, I totally get that he believes her, not me. And now I'm in prison. It's unfair. I didn't do anything wrong, and I was there for years. But you know what happened next? You are not going to believe what happened next. You want to know? I'll tell you next week. No! No! Woo! That's why I love the story of Joseph. Our theme today is awesome obedience. You know what? You probably couldn't fault Joseph with maybe going, well, she is the boss. You're supposed to obey the boss. Maybe if I just give her a little smooch, she'll be happy. Maybe she'll keep it a secret because you know, I think her boss, she wouldn't want her husband to know anyway, right? And he maybe could have lived out the rest of his life as the head of Potiphar's house with a little secret that he and Potiphar's wife just kept secret. But what you're going to find out as we get through the rest of Joseph's life is that going to prison, falsely accused, was all a part of God's plan. It was the low point. But something happens in prison that had he not obey God in Potiphar's house would have never happened. He would have never seen his brothers again. And the dream, the visions he had, they do come true and they would have never come true. He had to obey God even when it cost him everything. Put our connection point up there for today. Our theme today is awesome obedience. If we want to experience God's plan for our life, we have to be willing to obey God even if it costs us. Awesome obedience means obeying God no matter what the cost. Sometimes obeying is going to cost you. Sometimes doing what's right is going to cost you something. But you know what? We have to trust God in the process. All right? You can turn the lights back on. I brought a bunch of my Lego sets with me today. All right? I have my Millennium Falcon. All right? Uh, I actually have the giant one that you see in the Lego store, all right, that's like a zillion million pieces. Here's the instruction manual for it. It's too big uh, to bring, uh, but it's, it's really ginormous. This instruction manual is over 300 pages long, all right? I did bring the box to my uh, Star Destroyer, all right? Look at that, over 3,000 pieces, all right? The instruction manual for this uh, is always oh, right here. It's so big, it's like falling apart. This took me two weeks to build with a friend, working almost all day, every day, to put this together. Uh, this was pretty awesome. I have a, a, a small Star Destroyer. I haven't even put that one together yet. All right, I have, uh, what else do I have here? I have a clone uh, transport. All right, I've got, look at this Star inter uh, Interceptor that's in my office. Um, I have, uh, Another clone trooper. I have some X-wing fighters. All right, but this is my AT-AT. 
And uh, God has a plan for our life, right? Just like he had a plan for Joseph. And when he showed Joseph a glimpse of that plan in those dreams, it was like the picture. When you get a Lego kit, there's a picture on the front, right? But the, that's just the picture of the dream, right? That's not the finished product, right? You take it home and you open it and what's inside? All the pieces, right? It takes a long time to put this together, right? And you know, as you grow up, you are putting together the puzzle of God's plan for your life. So it comes with an instruction manual, right? And you know, have you ever been putting together a Lego kit and made a mistake? Have you ever gotten back here and something didn't line up? Have you ever had to go back and fix something? It's hard, right? You have to figure out where your mistake was. Well, you know, when you're a kid, it's like you're doing bag number one. And as you get older, you go to bag number two. And as you get older, you go to bag number three. You know what? When you're in preschool, you're just on the first couple bags. But as you get older, there's more and more bags, all right? But you got to keep doing the bags. But you know what? The Bible says that he that began a good work in you is going to carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus. We have to be willing to make tough choices. When we don't make a good choice, it costs us. If Joseph did not obey, it would have cost him. He might have missed out on God's plan for his life. 